Welcome to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School. My name is Robert Blaze and I'll be studying the Bible with you. And this quarter, we have a brand new lesson. We'll be talking about education. We're going to look at scripture through the lens of education. We're going to look at things like what's the purpose of education, the methods uh, that can be used. We're going to look at the importance of it as well as the role of scripture and the goal of God in education. And we'll be studying all of this right here on ABT. Welcome back to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School. I pray you've been blessed this week. We have an exciting lesson today. So before we go any further, let us pray. Father, we come to you now to first to thank you for all the blessings, Father, that you've given to us in the past several days. We thank you, Lord, that you've not only sustained us, but that you've provided all things for us. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you so much. For without you, Lord, I don't know where we would be. But now, Father, we come to you because of what we're about to do. We are about to open your word, Lord, and without the guidance of your spirit, we cannot find truth. We cannot understand, and we cannot know who you truly are. And so, Lord, I pray and I beg and I ask that you bestow upon us the Holy Spirit, that our ears may be cleansed so that we may hear and not have itching ears. I ask, Lord, that our heart may be ready to receive the word of truth so that it may be changed and transformed. And I ask, Lord, that you help each and every one of us to have this desire to know you and to love you. And I now pray for myself, Father, for I am not worthy to be sharing anything. And I pray, Lord, that you give me the right words, words of simplicity and words of truth, that as I share, Lord, what you've shared with me, that it may be a blessing to those who hear. I pray, Father, that Jesus may be seen today. And I have, Father, bless us. I pray this and the forgiveness of our sins in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. Last time we were together, our lesson was the eyes of the Lord, the biblical worldview. And what we looked at is how the worldview that we have shape our understanding and our action in this world. And because as a Christian, our worldview is shaped by scripture, we have a certain outlook on the world. As we understand the great controversy, salvation, sinfulness, the, the unseen world, the spiritual world that pulls behind the scenes, we have a very different understanding of the world and therefore our actions are also very different than somebody who does not have any of that. And so we have several insights that are different and therefore we are more understanding of certain things. But because of that, we also have a responsibility to not only share these things, but also to be patient with those who don't necessarily understand the things the way we do. Because of our biblical worldview, we, we also are privileged to have answers to the great questions of life. When we think about origin, or we think about purpose, destiny, morality, all these things the world cannot really answer, but through scripture, through the Bible, we have answers. And so that knowledge does make us different, but it also has to make us more compassionate, more kind, more patient, and definitely more loving to all of those around us. Today we'll be looking at Jesus as master teacher. That is the lesson title today. And you know, oftentimes we, we talk about Jesus and we focus almost solely on his mission on earth and especially what he did on the cross, his death for our sins. Now, it is excessively important. Yes, we ought to focus on that, but that's not all that Jesus is all about. It's true, it's central, but there's so much more to the mission of Jesus than simply him coming and dying for us. Because if it was the case, well, guess what? Jesus would not have had to be born as a child, as a baby, grown up to be a child and an adult. He would not have gone, had to gone through 30 years of life of toil and of temptation if all he needed to do was to come and die. He could have gone straight to do that. 
But the very fact that Jesus lived 30 plus years is very purposeful, meaning that it has a lot for us to, to understand and to be taught about. Jesus lived this long and among us and went through all this so that he could show us how we can also live and how we, quite frankly, ought to be living. But there's a second thing also that Jesus came to do, and that's what our memory text set the stage for. And our memory text is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. And I'd like to invite you to go there in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. We read, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, here we have something very interesting. We have a, a contrast and a comparison. So we have, on one hand, light. And this light here is contrasted with, of course, darkness. So we have these two opposite um, ideas and concepts that are at odds with each other. All right, so light and darkness. Now, what happens when light shines in darkness? What happens to the darkness? Well, the darkness is dispelled. Now, as we continue to read in the text, it says that there's a light that shined in our heart. So, if there's a light that shined in our heart, what does that say about the heart? Remember, there is a, a comparison. This is the contrast. Now we're going to have a comparison. So what does it say about our heart? Well, it says that if the light needs to shine in the heart, it means that our heart was actually in darkness. So we, according to God and according to Scripture, had a dark heart. And light needed to shine in there so that the darkness that is in the heart might be dispelled. Now, what type of light was shine in the heart to dispel the darkness? Well, according to the scripture, it says that it was to give the light of the knowledge. So the light that was shine in the heart to dispel the darkness of the heart is knowledge. And that is what dispels the darkness of the heart. And this way, our heart is no longer full of darkness. So then, if the light represents knowledge, then what does darkness actually represent? Well, that is very simple. What is the opposite of knowledge? Well, it's ignorance. So there was ignorance in our hearts. And that's what made our heart dark. And so there needed to be a light of knowledge to dispel the darkness of ignorance that was in our hearts. And so now, what kind of knowledge was that? Well, according to Scripture, it says that it was the knowledge of the glory of God. And so let's put that uh, right here so we, we understand that the knowledge is the knowledge of the glory of God. And the question becomes now, what is the glory of God? What is glory? Too often, we, we've seen representation of glory, and it's just basically light, something that shines. And it's a nice representation, but it doesn't tell us what it actually is, because it's not just light. The best way to demonstrate that is actually to go back in the Old Testament in the story of, of Moses talking with God in Exodus 33. Beginning in verse 17, we read, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Now, just that is amazing. God knows Moses by name. Does he know you and I by name? Goes on saying, Moses says, And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So Moses, having a conversation with God, boldly asked to see God's glory. 
And here is what God answers. And he says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he says, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Now, interestingly, here, Moses asks, I want to see your glory. God, show me your glory. And God says, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to proclaim my name. Because God's name is his glory. And here are some of the different attributes that God said he would make pass before Moses. Goodness and grace and mercy. But his face, that can't be seen. Because his face is too much for us to observe for, for a fallen human being because that is the fullness of God's glory. And if any man would see it, he would be consumed. The Bible says that God is a consuming fire and it is a consuming fire to all sinful men and women. And so here what God is basically saying is I'm going to show you my glory. I'm going to show you my, my righteousness. I will declare my righteousness before you. Verse 21, and the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory pass by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand. And while I pass by, I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now, I've never been as excited of seeing somebody's back. All right? that, that may sound funny, but you, know, you always want to see someone. You want to see their face. You want to see what they look like. But here, the only thing that can be actually seen of God is his back. And that is exciting because nobody else has ever seen that except for God. The only person that has ever seen God, according to Scripture, is Jesus himself. And so here Moses, a human, fallen, gets to see God's back. Next chapter, beginning in verse 5, it says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquities, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children, and upon the third and the fourth generations. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Now, I, I don't even know if Moses had the time to see God's back. But, but what we see here is as God declares his glory by giving us his name, Moses hears it. And the moment that he starts hearing these, these righteous attributes, that he starts to understand that this is God, immediately he falls to his face and begins to worship. Because he's seen, he's heard the name of God. He's seen and he's heard his character. 2 Corinthians 4.6 tells us that it was to give the light of the knowledge of the glory, or if you will, the character of God, and that was to be accomplished and imparted in the face of Jesus Christ. So in order to see the glory of God, that was the reason, a major reason why Jesus came, so that we may understand and we may know the glory of God, that we may see his character fully. You see, when you, you look at the life of Jesus, you observe his character, his teaching, you get a perfect reflection of God's own character, of his glory. Is how you, you get to have a perfect view of the character or the glory of God in Jesus. And that tells, you, tells, tells us actually a few things. It tells us that character, righteous character, is not dependent on human nature or on divine nature. It is dependent on right choices. Because even Jesus, in his humanity, was able to reflect 
the divine character of God, his righteous character. He was able to be a perfect example of righteousness. And that is one of the important reasons why Jesus came on earth. It was to give us a proper understanding, a right uh, view of what God was like. It was a true representation of, his, of the righteousness of God. Because you see, uh, I'm sure you've heard that a lot, where people are actually saying, you know, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. But that's not true. The problem is that we have a corrupt, skewed, misunderstood view of the character of God in the Old Testament. And so Jesus came to rectify that so that you and I may understand and may see the glory of God the way it ought to be seen. And Jesus accomplished that by coming here on earth. And so the two things we're going to look at today is we're going to, we're going to look at how Jesus came to reveal uh, the Father, to reveal the character of the Father. That's the first thing we're going to look at as we've already started looking at that. And then we're going to look at something called reconciliation. Now that sounds like a very complicated word, but it's actually a very important doctrine of the Bible that unfortunately we do not necessarily talk sufficiently about, but that was one of the reasons also why Jesus came here and something that he taught us. In fact, it is so important that though we will begin to talk about it today, we will only finish to talk about it next week. And so revealing the Father, let's go to our scripture, let's go to Hebrews 1, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 4. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, had in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being so much better than the angel, as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent uh, name than they. Now, uh, keep in mind that in this passage, it says the express image of this, of this person, the Greek word for image actually is character. So image is character. It's the concept of a, a stamp or uh, an engraving, a copy. The idea is it was supposed to fully, completely, and accurately reflect the original. Just like when you go to a, a photocopy machine and you, you place your paper there and you want a reproduction so that you can have a perfect copy of what the original looks like. That was the reason why Jesus came, and interestingly, that is also the purpose of our creation. In Genesis 1, 26, 27, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fall of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in his own character, if you will. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now, of course, we understand that because of the fall, because of sin, that image was marred and almost completely destroyed. But you know what? The, the purpose of man, even though there's sin that came in, has not changed. Our purpose has always been and always will be to reflect fully the character of God. And Jesus came to show us not only what that looks like, but also that it is possible. Testimony to the Church, Volume 5, page 743. God has commanded us, commanded us, be ye holy, for I am holy. And an inspired apostle declares that, that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Holiness is agreement with God. By sin, the image of God in man has been marred and well nigh obliterated. It is the work of the gospel to restore that which has been lost. 
and we are to cooperate with the divine agency in this work. And how can we come into harmony with God? How shall we receive his likeness unless we obtain a knowledge of him? It is this knowledge that Christ came into the world to reveal unto us. So Christ came again, and I'm going to keep repeating that because that's important. He didn't just come to die on the cross. He came to show us how to live, and he came to give us a proper, correct, accurate understanding of who God is like, of what his character is like. And uh, out of the four gospel writer, John is probably the one who understood that best. It is in his gospel that we, we have the uh, more and more of reference to that. Um, from the get-go, John establishes that point. John, John 1, in verse 1 to 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him... And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of, the, of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So again, we have this reference here of Jesus being the light of the knowledge of the glory of God who came to shine in the darkness, and the darkness was in our heart. And we couldn't understand. We didn't get it. We didn't see it the first time Jesus came. And then in verse 14, we read this, And the word was made flesh and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, John clearly understood that part of the reason why Jesus came was to give us a revelation of the glory of God so that we may understand his character. That's why... We'll, we'll spend a lot of time now in John. He records that story in John 14, beginning in verse 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, com no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Jesus says, if you spent enough time with me, you would know what the Father looks like. You would know who he is. You would know his character. And now that you've spent time with me, now that you've seen me, now that you've known me, you know the Father. You know what he is like. But then in verse 8, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. So, of course, here, uh, Philip is more focused on the physical appearance of the father while jesus was talking that's not what you need to see what you need to see is his character and so jesus said unto him in verse 9 have i been so long time with you and yet has thou not known me philip he that had seen me had seen the father and how sayest thou then show us the father don't you know philip if you if you know me if you've seen me you know the Father. You've seen the Father. Verse 10, Believe this thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The word that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. What Jesus is trying to get across is that he's saying, Look, you look at my life, you look at my work, you look at my words, you look at my teaching, and that gives you a clear, not only inside, but a clear, perfect picture of who God, of who the Father is. Uh, just look at some of the other things that, that John record about Jesus saying about his Father. In John 5, 19 and 20, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, there also doeth the Son likewise. So just something very important to notice is that God is active. There's a, there's a lot of pictures out there, there's a lot of idea where God is seen as someone kind of like just sitting on a throne there and, and not doing anything. And just like criticizing people. And so, but here we, we have a clear 
uh, clear teaching from Jesus that God actually is a God of example. He demonstrates what he wants us to do. And Jesus confirmed that what he was doing is that he was doing what the Father was doing. He was repeating the Father's action. He also says in verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son, showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Now, obviously this text tells us that the Father loves Jesus. Now, he didn't just send his sons to be butchered on earth. He didn't just send him so that he would, he would die. And he certainly does not delight in his death. No, he said that he loved him. And because he loved him, he has no secret for him. He shows him everything and even greater things. Later, Jesus also said in John 16, 27, For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and I have believed that I came out from God. The same love that the Father has for the Son, he has for you and me. That is, that is amazing. Now, the Bible also teaches us that the Father is actually very generous, very giving. John 6, 32, 33 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Uh, of course, I could have gone to John 3, 16, but I like this, the, the fact that here it talks about the bread and that is, of course, Jesus. And God gave Jesus as the bread to nourish us, to strengthen us, and to guide us. In John 15, 14, 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And here we have a picture of, of the Father sending the Holy Spirit to represent Jesus. And we read in other places that God is so willing to give the Holy Spirit that he is more willing to give us the Holy Spirit than Father are willing to give good gifts to their children. He's just, he just wants to give us the Holy Spirit. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I, I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. But whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And so, through Jesus, the Father is willing to give so much more. I, we don't fully understand and grasp what that means. But there's nothing beyond our imagination that the Father cannot give to us. John 6, 44, No man, last verse, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, I like what this verse says because it doesn't just say that God is present, right? that he exists. A lot of, of, of pagan religion talks about a God who, who put things in motion and then he's just hands off. But no, here we're, we're told that this God is different because not only does he want to dwell among us and spend time with us, he is looking to draw us to him. He wants to woo us to him. He is looking for a relationship. The Bible we're going to look at that in a moment, speaks of a reconciliation. Jesus even explained that God is anticipating that one day we will be with him. In John 14, 1 to 4, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. And one of the things with that verse is we always look at the fact of how Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. 
But you know, he's going to prepare a place in mansions. These mansions already exist because God already placed them, put them in place. And what Jesus now is going to prepare a special, specific place for each of us. But the Father is the one that built them. He's the one that set them up and prepared them because he's expecting us to be there with him. Now, these, of course, are you know, a, a, quite a quick overview of, of some of the example of Jesus teaching us about the Father. But, you know, when you think about it, over the course of his life, Jesus did a, a lot of miracles. He did a lot of healing. But the power for each and every one of these actions actually came from the Father. The Father is the one that bestowed those power to Jesus to accomplish that. The teachings of Jesus came from the Father. Every action that Jesus took was to reflect his Father's glory. You see, Jesus was very much aware that everything he would do, everything he would say, every glance he would uh, take, and whatever he would be doing, it would be a direct reflection on the character of God. It would give an insight as to who the Father was. And sometimes I wonder, since it is also our purpose to also reflect the character of God, are we as aware as Jesus was about our actions, our thoughts, and our words? John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now we, we often focus on, on, this, on the fact that God so loved and God gave. And of course, that verse definitely talks about that. But this verse also implies a, an intense desire of the Father to be with us, to be one with the human family once again. And not just for a brief period of time, but for all eternity. You see, it's not just that, it's not just that God wants to fix something that's broken. It's not just that. He, he wants, he's longing to be with those whom we were separated from a long time ago. Have you, I don't know, have you ever had somebody you, you truly love? You truly, truly love? And because of, you know, whatever circumstances, whatever they may be, um, and, and, you know, pretty much out of your control, you're separated from them? You know, it's, it's you know, you, you can't see any way of being with them again. You, you, can, you can think about it, you can try, and it just, it just looks completely impossible. You never really forget these things, you know. It's, it's, you can always recall these feelings, emotions. It's like, it's, it's like life. Life lost its flavor. You know, nothing is the same. It's difficult, it's painful, it's, it's even hard to describe. But if you've gone through that, you get a little bit of a glimpse. Now imagine... God, kind of going through something like that, and probably a lot more intense, because he loves fully and completely, and he's separated fully and completely from the people that he wants to be with the most. And it's not just one person, it's many, many people. And he has this hope and this expectation and this desire for that relationship to finally be mended. And that's what he's looking for. And, and so he, he's standing there. That's what he wants. And that's what the Bible talks about, something called the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. Begins, it reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So the ministry 
of reconciliation. There are a few things to notice. First, verse 17, it speaks of a, a renewal, if you will, a, a transformation that took place in men. So much so that, that you and I can be new creature. Now, the better translation would be a new creation. It implied that it's not something that evolves from an old form to a new form, but rather something that is completely new, completely different than the old one. It's that type of, uh, of changes, of transformation that is affected by the ministry of reconciliation. Now, verse 18 tells us that this reconciliation was initiated and carried out by God himself, not us. Jesus was the agent that God used to reconcile us. And so now the question is, what is reconciliation? Well, reconciliation is, is an adjustment or a restoration to favor. It's where we get the, the word atonement for, from. It's, it's this idea of people being at odds, being at enmity, being separated, and they're brought back into unity and into a, a, a relationship that is positive. Now, notice that it was God, not us, but God who initiated the reconciliation. It was not us, but we were at fault. To be fair, we were the one that strayed, we were the one that went wrong. We should have been the one trying to uh, initiate this reconciliation. We should have been the one trying to fix the problem. But God knew and understood that that was actually impossible for us to do. Romans 8 verse 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, that means it's hostile against God, it has no desire toward God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So it's not just that, that the mind is enmity with God, it's, it's, and that's the mind of the old creation, right? The, the one before the new creation. But it's not subject to the law of God. So it cannot submit to God, and it says that it cannot be. Indeed, can be. It is impossible for the carnal mind to subject itself to the law of God. Therefore, it is impossible, it was impossible for us to actually initiate reconciliation because we had no desire for it. And that's what Jesus took care of. In fact, when you read Ephesians 2.16, it talks about Jesus uh, who slew the enmity. And so God initiated a reconciliation that we could not initiate, and once he's done that, we read that he gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. So what does that mean? Well, the next verse actually is, again, another parallel, and it gives us an understanding. It says, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespassing unto them, and had committed unto us the, world, the word of reconciliation. So, we were committed. It was given to us. We became responsible for that ministry, that word of reconciliation, which is the teaching of the plan of salvation, the gospel, if you will. It's the idea that once we've been reconciled, we now have a, a duty, a duty to go and to teach that reconciliation is available to everyone and anyone. Also note that God, it says, was in Christ. So he was not standing afar off. He didn't just send Jesus, hey, you take care of this. No, no, he was there. He was involved personally, and you can almost think physically in that reconciliation. He's the one who was doing the reconciling. And the next few verse uh, continues to describe how this ministry was given to us. Paul says, now then, we are ambassador for Christ, meaning we are representative of Christ. We are there to represent 
Jesus to anyone we come across to. As though, look at that, God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled with God. Paul is saying, it's a, we are not ambassadors. It's like Jesus, uh, God through us, we came to you and God through us is telling you, be reconciled. Be reconciled with God. And that's exactly what we ought to be doing. For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So clearly, if you've noticed here, the uh, sister doctrine of reconciliation is righteousness by faith. It's this idea that uh, God has done everything for us to be once again righteous, to be righteous and to keep that righteousness. And so again, as we study the life of Jesus, as we study his life, we are also studying who God is, who the Father is. And everything that he did, everything that he was able to do, it was because the Father empowered him and allowed him and gave him what he needed to do it. There is nothing that Jesus did that he did on his own or contrary to God's will. See, when Jesus took humanity, he, he didn't... Uh, lose, if you will, his divinity. No, no, no. It ne but he kept that divinity, but he never used it. He never exerted that power. It was hidden under the garb of humanity. And so everything he did, he did it through the power, not of his divinity, but through the power of God. And it was uh, through that empowerment that, that he was able to show to us, look, that's also available to you. You can also do these things. And so he lived truly and fully as a human within the human family. John 8, 29 says, And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And so Jesus lived a full, complete life in accordance to God, for the pleasure of God, and reconciliation was part of that. And so, again, just to reemphasize, the clearest picture that we will ever have of God is by looking at who Jesus is. Once we get to truly know who Jesus is, we will know, without a shadow of a doubt, who God is. I want to leave you with these words from Councils for the Church, page 75. It says, Christ, the light of the world, veiled the dazzling splendor of his divinity and came to live as a man among men, that they might, without being consumed, become acquainted with their creator. No man has seen God at any time except as he is revealed through Christ. Christ came to teach human beings what God desires them to know. In the heavens above, in the earth, in the broad waters of the ocean, we see the handiwork of God. All created things testify to his power, his wisdom, his love, but not from the stars or the ocean or the cataract can we learn of the personality of God as it is revealed in Christ. God saw that a clearer revelation than nature was needed to portray his personality and his character. He sent his son unto the world to reveal, so far as we could injure by human sight, the nature and the attributes of the invisible God. Christ revealed all of God that sinful human beings could bear without being destroyed. He is the divine teacher the Enlightener. Had God thought us in need of revelation other than those made through Christ and his written word, he would have given them. Let us pray. Father, we want to come to thank you. For Father, we may have had a darkness in our heart. We may not have understood who you were. In fact, Isaiah says that there was gross darkness over the people. But Father, you sent Jesus, the light of man, to give us the right 
knowledge and understanding of who you are. And Father, we are thankful for Jesus, who has spent countless years on this earth to reflect who you truly are, that we may understand the type of God you are and the character that you possess. And Father, with, with this amazing revelation, we are thankful to know that you are the way you are and that you love us, that you care for us, that you look for us, that you want to be with us, and that you have done, Father, everything. And so, Lord, we want to, not only we want to reflect your character, Father, but we also want to answer your call to be with you. Father, help us to do everything so that one day we may be together, that we may be able to see you more fully. And I thank you, Lord, for Again, not leaving us in darkness, but giving us all the light that we need. I now ask that you forgive our sin and cleanse us, that you reconcile us once more with you, that you bestow upon us the righteousness of Christ, and that you make us one with you as Jesus was one with you. And I pray this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, our righteousness, Jesus. Amen.